What's up guys, it's GMX and today's video is all about learning how to beat Hikaru Nakamura. In fact, Nakamura might be the most famous name in chess, perhaps after Magnus Carlsen, Gary Kasparov and Bobby Fischer, because he actually recently got over 1 million subscribers on his YouTube channel. So, with that being said, now let's see how to win against him, and who better to see this, uh, a more player to see how to beat him than the current world champion Magnus Carlsen. Now, this game was won from the new chess classic uh, Rapid Tournament, from Chess 24, where Nakamura played the Queen's Gambit and Carlsen played the Queen's Gambit declined, but he played it with a little bit of a twist. Now I should say actually that in recent tournaments, actually the score between Nakamura and Carlsen has been quite close to balance, where Car not in many tournaments Nakamura has reached the final and really made Carlsen work all the way to the final game in order to get the win in the match. So, and actually I remember Carlsen also recently said that he was sort of the most annoying opponent for him due to his ability to find many great resources in difficult positions. So Carlson at this point played a shortcut a6, the Janowski variation of the Queen's Gambit decline. So what's the idea of a6? Well, basically, it, the idea of the move is that if white were to play some developing move like knight to f3, we can then play d takes c4, and a6 is then very useful in building a nice pawn chain and being able to hang on to that extra pawn with b5, uh, should be b5 here. And if they go a4, then you're going to kick the knight with b4, and although white does get back the pawn in this position, Black is going to get very good play like c5 and just with normal Miran developing moves, Black will fully equalize here. So if White wants to fight for an opening advantage against a6, he really needs to play the move cd5. And then after ed5, normally White plays the move knight to f3, but then Black can go for knight f6. And it turns out this up with bishop g5, bishop e6. And knight bd7 is actually very solid for Black. In fact, White's best attempts for advantage often involve him actually retreating the bishop back to f4 later. So Nakamura says, okay, let's just put the bishop on f4 directly and just put the bishop on a very nice long diagonal here. So black played the move knight f6 and after e3, actually this is a position that can also arise if you had the bishop on e7 rather than the pawn on a6. But Carlson's argument is that this is a little bit of a better version because he can play the move bishop to d6 in one go and off the exchange of bishops because, well, if white does exchange as happened in the game, well, black can go queen takes d6, and he managed to develop his queen with a tempo to a nice active square. Now, it's worth pointing out that bishop d6 is not the only move in this position. I actually think that if white wants to obtain an advantage, maybe he should look into the move queen to f3. Which might look very weird, but it actually has a kind of similar idea in it. Rather than exchanging first and helping black's queen get to a more active square of the recapture, we keep that tension between the bishops, so that if they take... Well, then our queen gets to a much more active square... We kind of have cleared the f3 square for the knight that way, and that will give white an improved version of an exchange queen's gambit declined. Of course, black can play other moves as well, like moves like c5 are also kind of interesting, heading for an iqp position where maybe the queen would have rather been on d1. Okay, definitely line can still be discussed, but it does seem like white has a very small pull because of the weakness of the iqp, but I imagine a Carlson point would have been happy to get such a meaty position in the game. Uh, there's also moves like c6, but I find them a little bit passive in comparison here. Well, the game saw bishop d6, queen d6, white played bishop d3, and here Carlson showed his creative spirit, because a normal move would be to play something like castles here, you know, just develop normally. One interesting point about these lines is that sometimes you're actually going to see the knight develop to c6 rather than d7, where at first the knight may seem a bit misplaced on this square, but actually when you get it to a square like e7, it ends up being quite flexible, and you can often trade off their good bishop to kind of try and equalize in that way. But Carlson played the move bishop g4 instead, maybe trying to provoke some weakening move like f3. So a very provocative move by black. I'm not sure if it's necessarily the best one here. I mean, a move like queen d2, for example, and h3 probably leaves the bishop looking a little bit silly. But I guess Carlson's idea is that you can still go bishop h5 and, well, maybe trade off that bishop in this way with this creative maneuver. It doesn't necessarily equalize, but it gives a very fresh position with not much opening fury uh, to it. And that's the sort of thing where Carlson off feels very in his element, just getting a very safe position where, you know, you can just play chess and outplay the opponent on technique rather than memorization. So we can see then that the first step to beating Hikaru Nakamura is sort of to basically get him out of fury. Although his tree is still very good when out of fury, but it's certainly, if he hasn't done some deep preparation, he's more likely to make a mistake in the early phase of the game. So after queen to b3, well, black played a move knight c6, and I'm not sure if knight c6 is actually the best move here, where the move knight bd7 might be a bit more solid, because... Well, it's just a more flexible, harmonious square in a lot of these positions if you're able to be able to bring that knight towards c4 at certain points. And you actually don't have to fear queen takes b7. It actually has a trap that would run into knight b6. 
And then after bishop c8, the white queen is actually trapped. So that's definitely something to keep in mind when uh, with this position. And also with knight c6, it is true that here, queen b7. Again, it's not so effective. At least it's not losing the queen here. But after rook b8, it turns out black does get a lot of compensation for the pawns. Where black has a big lead in development. Moves like knight b4 and forking the queen and bishop are very annoying for white. So black would actually have full compensation for the material here. That's I think why Nakamura decided to play to move h3, which is a pretty good move at this point. I'm uh, just asking where the bishop will go. You know, rook c1 is another move to put the rook on this open file. After uh, bishop h5, why now play the move rook knight g to e2. Again, a very natural move, and it does try to exploit a disadvantage of the bishop development that with knight f4, you can try to win the bishop for a knight. But again, it seems according to the computer, the move rook c1 might have been best. And I know rook c1 is basically trying to prepare queen b7 by putting some more pressure on that knight in advance. For example, a move like castles. Well, I can play very sharply, play a move like g4. And this is a very computer line, so I can sort of understand why Nakamura didn't go for it. But I think that this idea of taking and then playing g5 and winning the pawn, it's extremely audacious, but it seems to actually be quite sound. Where after knight h5, you can play queen d5. And it seems that white just has a safe extra pawn in this position. Now, granted, it's true black is not forced to castle, but if you castle long, you're kind of asking for a knight a4, c5, and then your king is really very exposed to an attack. So that's not really very appealing for black either, to be honest. Well, instead, white played knight g2, and that sort of allowed Carlson to somewhat justify his play, because he was able to recycle his bishop with bishop e2. And after knight e2 and castle, I think that black is actually in very good shape in this position, because the bishop is not really better than the knight. It looks better, but... The structure is quite closed, and that somewhat plays into the knight's hands here. And, I mean, I played the move rook c1, threatening the move queen takes b7 uh, by hitting the knight. But now with the move knight d8, we see that even though the knight looks very awkward on d8, it's actually not such a bad square. I mean, you're going to be able to defend that pawn on b7 later. And once the knight gets to e6 and potentially g5, it actually is doing a good job of controlling the center and not letting white get an easy break on the, on the center. So it means in a position like this, White's relying a bit more on making queenside play work, which is maybe why a move like a4 and going for b4, b5 minority attacks might be the best plan for White in this position. Well, instead, White played the move queen a3, offering a trade of queens, and actually it's an extremely creative idea from Nakamura, because if Black does take, which does seem to be the most solid move, well, it turns out the open files actually give White quite interesting play. For example, if we play king e6, White's going to go king d2, Put the rooks on these files, and I still think the position is probably close to equal, but it is a tiny bit better for white, I think, on a practical level, where you are going to be a little bit passive in dealing with that pressure. In fact, the computer recommends a very radical idea of playing rook c8, and going c5, kind of exchanging the pressure in order to, like, open up the position, and, well, kind of get a solid IQP position that's maybe marginally worse, but where black can probably still hold the draw. But instead, we had to move queen d7, kind of keeping the piece on the board, which maybe is not necessarily that much of a weaker move, but it definitely is a way to keep the, the play going a bit more. So we can see step two to being Nakamura is basically taking some risks. Because one reason that Nakamura is so strong and Blitz that he knows how to kind of put pressure on the opponent and how to take his chances. And that's sort of what Carlson does quite well here. Where, interestingly enough, a move like knight g1 might not be all that stupid. Because once a knight gets to f3 and e5, you are hitting the queen and getting some of that time back. Of course, there's a very deep strategic idea and one I think would be very hard to have the courage to play in a blitz game. It is a bit of a computerish idea. Actually, this was a rapid game in any case. So we had castles. Black played g6, you know, just putting his pawns on the light squares. And in doing so, he's doing a very good job of constricting the opponent's remaining bishop. In fact, it's known as Capablanca's rule when you put the pawns on the same color complex as the opponent's bishop. Now, maybe white should have gone b4 and perhaps think forward about doing something like knight c3. But I think if you get the knight to c5, you could have a little bit of annoying piece pressure on the queen side to work with like after, say, c6, knight, a4. You know, you could make an argument that with a4, b5 coming after that, the white might still have a little bit of a pull here. Because normally black would want to get a knight to c4 in such structures, but he's not really in position to do that here. Well, the game saw knight f4. And after the move, rook e8, bishop c2, and c6. I do think the castle is equalized here. And certainly with the bishop versus knight imbalance and the imbalance in the structure, it only gives a lot of scope for the stronger player on the day to win. So the game went knight d3. Carlson played the move knight e6, trying to neutralize any knight c5 by being able to chop it off. And if knight e5, you can just go queen e7. And well, with the trade of queens, like obviously with a knight e5, I usually is playing this idea of f4 and f5 to attack the king. But in this position, it doesn't really work that well when the queens are coming off. 
I mean, I guess you could still make an argument this position is still more equal for white. You know, I can play moves like g3 or even g4 and, you know, maybe try to expand on the king's side to get some chances. Because white does still have the idea of playing on the queen's side. So it is a bit more flexible on black, both flanks. But black is very solid with no real weaknesses. I think that if you maneuver the knight to d6 to meet b4 and knight c4 in some moments, then in general your position should be very, very robust as black. Of course, I kick the knight away of f6, which is a nice added bonus here. So the game saw f4, you know, Nakamura decided to try to go for the attack in this version with an accelerated f4 and then f5. And it's actually a very interesting idea because if you take with knight takes f5, white's going to go knight c5 and double the pawns with bishop f5. And then the weak king is going to give white good compensation. So Carlson says, well, I'm not going to allow these Nakamura tricks. I'm just going to go g5 and tie up the board, saying that, well, this pawn is not really going anywhere when it's blockaded by the knight. I mean, even though the engine says position is equal, it's worth keeping in mind that White has somewhat burned his bridges a little bit. If he doesn't manage to justify his play, he is going to have a weak pawn on e4, a weak square on e4, and a weak backward pawn on e3. So you can see that it's step three to being Nakamura is kind of to, in a sense, use his strengths against him, saying, okay, I'm going to use the fact he wants to attack to sort of lure him into overextending a bit, like being in that really solid position, allowing him to kind of play these sort of weakening strategic moves for dynamic play. Because Nakamura definitely is one of the absolute trickiest players in the world, uh, right up there with Magnus Carlsen, but time that can also work against him, as we'll see in this game. In this case, well, the move knight e5 was played, and after queen c7, he again continued trying to attack with this move of h4. And this, I think, the point where the game starts to turn against white, because I think that the best way for white to play is to kind of give up a bit on the king side and realize that, okay, the king side is locked, so let's try to attack on another part of the board. Actually, a move like e4 would be very interesting here, with the idea that if black does take the pawn, then you can go queen e3, and you know, actually, then the attack on g5 does actually kind of happen. So there's a lot more to the position here, but white does seem to be getting decent play, based on the fact that you know the black king is kind of exposed, and the way to exploit it is indeed to open the position. But this was the right way, I think, to do it. I mean, to be fair, there are also moves like rook d3, like I think if you just build up the position and maybe go for b4, a4, b5 at some point, I think definitely it's also quite reasonable, but it does feel like Black is sort of getting the better side of the position somehow if White doesn't do something quite direct. But after h4, well, what would be your way of dealing with this attacking move if you were Black here? Can you play like Carlsen and implement step 4 of how to beat Hikaru Nakamura yourself? Now, of course, it takes a lot of good chess practice in order to beat strong chess players, so do make sure to like this video to make sure that you boost the algorithm and also so I know to make more videos like this one in the future. So after h4, black played the move g4. And with g4, the idea is that rather than weakening our king side or letting it open up, we're just going to lock up the board and kill his bishop. Because if rook f4, we can simply play... Well, even a move like h5 is solid enough, but actually there's even a better move, which we're going to actually see in the game. I kind of don't want to spoil it just yet. Uh, well... After queen c3, black played knight g to h5, not allowing any counterplay of rook f4, and kind of exploring some of the weaknesses that have been created by this very reckless h4 move. And after queen e1, this is where Carlsen implemented the step 4 of how to beat Hikaru Nakamura, and that's to take the advantage that you've gained and transform it into an even better advantage. The way that he did that here was... And there are a lot of good moves for black, so whatever answer you come up with in the comments below, probably it's the right, a good move. But the move rook e5, I think, is the very best one. Where I think giving up the exchange for a pawn is a small price to pay in order to get that beautiful g3 outpost for your pieces and to leave white with very weak pawns on e3 and b2, not to mention a whole cornucopia of weak squares of white on the king side. So after queen c3, like this sort of makes sense that when white has a weaker king, it's in his best interest to trade off the queens. Carlson says no thank you and plays queen to g3, going after the pawn. Nakamura tries to insist on the trade, but Actually, in this position, you could even play a move like rook e8. Actually, it turns out that the trade of queens is actually not so bad for black. Because if they take, well, your knight gets to g3. And it's one of these situations where actually strategically white's basically lost. Because without an open file for the rooks, they just end up being very passive. And even some idea like, let's say, putting a knight on e4 and just taking f5 and taking h4 is really very difficult for white to deal with at this point. Well, Carlson's move of queen d6 is also very strong. Just keeping the queens and leaving white kind of stewing in his own juices with that weak king. The game ended as follows with queen f2, rook to e8, rook to cd1, and you know, even a resource player's Nakamura was unable to turn the game around here. Black played queen e5, just centralizing everything here. And after rook d4, then the move c5, just kicking that rook back. 
And after Rook DD2 there, a lot of very good moves for Black. I mean, even just a move like G3. Uh, well, Castle played Knight G3, but even G3 just putting that Fawn Pawn in their king, around their king, and then taking the pawn here. Yeah, this would be winning as well. I mean, Queen E5 is going to renew the pressure against that weak E3 pawn. And it doesn't hurt to have some passes on that queen side as well. Well, Black played Knight to G3. Uh, we had Rook FD1 and you know, King F8. Very Carlson-esque move. Just slightly improving the position. Like getting that king ready for the winning endgame. They had Rook D3. The Knight came F E4. I think Knight E8 G4 might have been better. Because this does give White the option to play Rook to D5. Uh, and then, okay, it's true that Black is still winning here. Like, you do still have Queen F6, Bishop E4, and Queen H4, which is going to be very similar to what we see in the game, but, okay, this is probably a better version with Queen C2, and, you know, I can at least play a move like Rook C5 and try to sack the exchange to, to keep the game going. Uh, well, instead, why I played Queen E1, trying to keep the pieces on the board and hoping that these knights would somehow be superfluous, but it turned out not to be the case. After Queen F6, there is no good defense to Queen F6 and going for Queen H1 mate. The game ended. Queen Rook takes D5. Queen takes H4. And after Bishop E4, Carlson played Queen H1 check. King F2, Knight takes E4. So Ering is coming with check. So White doesn't have time to take the Queen here. After King E2, Queen G2 and King D3. Nakamura resigned here without waiting for Carlson's next move. Because the King is just hopelessly weak on D3. And Black has not even given up any material for it. There are a lot of winning moves here, like queen takes b2 is good enough. The computer's way is to go for c4 and sack the pawn in order to get the queen in the attack with check. And, well, in that case, I mean, if king b4, like you're just taking more and more pawns with check and the king is going on a, let's say, a hunt to its death. But if you play king d4, black has quite a beautiful move like knight d2. Not the only move, but it's kind of cool when you can play such moves like interfering and just setting up either a rook e4, mate. Or a knight f3 mate. You know, I can't really avoid both of these ideas. So there you have it. That's how Nakamura... Well, how Carlson beat Nakamura in this game. As a quick recap, basically the steps were... Step 1 to get Nakamura out of his uh, opening knowledge. Step 2 was then to kind of do... Just create a sort of imbalance in the position for Scope to outplay the opponent. Step 3 was kind of to use Nakamura's amazing tactical vision against himself. By game to play for tricks that weakened his position. Step 4 was then to transform the advantage that we gain into an even greater advantage. And okay, step 5 was just to convert the advantage into the win with very good technique as Carlson did in this game. So if you enjoyed this video, do make sure to like it to support the channel. And also make sure to subscribe to stay up to date with more of my Grandmaster Chess videos. So good luck in your next games against that very strong chess player. And I will see you guys in the next chess video.